Ladies and gentlemen, hello again, and welcome to another Reflected Reality Simulations video. My name's Graham, this is X-Plane 11, and the Felis 747-200. It's part two of the video series, and today we're looking at the pilot actions. We're going to set up the aircraft navigation systems, the performance calculations, the INS, and we'll get the aircraft back off the stand, push back and taxi out, and take off. Before we jump inside, just a quick continuity note. I did record uh, this video previously as a follow on from part one, but I had some issues with the sound recording, which meant I've had to record it again. I've tried my very best to set the aircraft up in the state that it was uh, when you saw it at the end of video one, but there may be some minor differences in there. I hope we can just work with that and we'll work through it. See the aircraft's on the stand with the chocks in, the APU is running, the external power is still plugged in, but it's uh, not using it at the moment. Air conditioning's on and running, everything else is pretty much ready to go. So all we've got to do is set up the navigation and the performance. So first things first, we're going to fly the departure from Heathrow, from with 27 right. It's the Umlat departure. And all we're going to do is transfer the information on the chart onto the MCP and the radios. So firstly, it's runway 27 right. We're going to depart on, that's roughly heading 270. And we're always going to leave the aircraft in heading mode for getting airborne. We never get airborne in INS or forelock on this aircraft. Always heading mode, just like the older 737s. From the departure, we're going to fly ahead to 3D from the London VOR. Just looking at the London VOR here, we're never going to fly a radial off the London. It's just the distance we're interested in. So in that case, I'll put it on the uh, other side here. I'll put it on the number two radio, 113.6. We should get a DME indication from it because it's very close by. We'll just turn on the ident here, make sure we get London. Excellent. So this aircraft uses the Libradio plugin. I believe it's the first aircraft to market using the Libradio plugin. And what that gives you is a much more realistic simulation of the radio aids. You've got terrain masking on the radio aids. So if you've got an NDB, for example, that's in a valley, you may not be able to hear it when there's a hill between you and the radio navigation beacon. You've got proper idents that change in readability depending on the range and that sort of thing. It's by the same developer that produces the uh, Hot Start EBM 900, and it's a really excellent use of the plugin. It's open source and it's available for any uh, add-on developers to integrate in their uh, aircraft. So we've identified London as the uh, DME here. I head to 3D, it's displaying on the DME indicator there. We're then going to turn on course or track 297 towards the Burnham NDB, which is uh, frequency 421. Let's put the NDB on here. Let's see if we can tune four, two, one. Make sure the transfer switch is set correctly. I'll put it on the other side as well because uh, we're not going to use the NDB for much. So we may as well have them both showing. And to display it, I'll make sure the RMI is set to ADF on the number one needle on both sides. It's probably a little bit too far away at the moment. If this was a stock X-plane aircraft without Lib Radio, you'd be able to ident this no problem at all. Well, because there's a lot of um, obstructions between us and it, you'll not be able to ident it just yet. And that's another realistic feature of Lib Radio. When we get to Burnham, we're going to pick up the radio 356 out of Midhurst on 114.0. So 114.0. And we'll put that on the number one side. And the course was 356. Now, I really want the first officer be able to see Midhurst as well. You see at the moment they're looking at London because we need the DME. But if I flick this switch here to number one, keep an eye on the first officer's um, HSI. Now both HSIs are looking at the number one radio and the number one course selector. So although we've got London on the DME2, the number two HSI is still showing Midhurst, which is what we need for the departure. From there, we're climbing up. We're going to be above 3,000 feet and below 6,000 feet, above 4,000 feet, and then at 6,000 feet for Umlat. So that's the stop altitude. We'll set 6,000 feet in there, and then on towards Woburn. 
So that's pretty much it for the departure. That seems fairly straightforward. We get airborne, fly to 3D, turn right about 30 degrees, out towards Burnham, and then intercept the radio from Mid Midhurst and routing out towards the north. That should be fairly straightforward. We could continue the rest of the flight in the UK on VOR Airways, but because we've got the inertial navigation system, I'm going to use that, and I'm going to use that a little bit earlier than maybe realistic for the aircraft, simply because I'm doing the job of three people. So by using the INS to navigate, rather than continuing on the airways, it just reduces the workload that little bit. So what we need is an INS flight plan. I've got these waypoints out of Simbrief. You can do it from Sky Vector as well. It's really fairly straightforward. The first waypoint I want to enter is Wobun here. So let's have a look at the initial navigation system. You see it's gone down to zero on the performance index here, and you can see the uh, aircraft is already in nav and it's ready to go. That's one change, that's a continuity issue from the previous video. So it wasn't a line on the previous video, it's gone down to zero and I've put it into nav, so it's ready to go. Okay, so what we're going to do is load these waypoints in. I'm going to put the remote button on here, here, and here. And all that means is the data that I'm entering on one keyboard goes into the other two units. Now that's all I need to do. I don't need to do anything on the number two INS or the number three INS. It will receive the data. But because we're diligent pilots, I'm going to put it to waypoint mode, select waypoint one on both of these, just to verify that the information fills across. So to enter the waypoint, I simply choose waypoint number one, so select the dial to waypoint, choose number one on the thumb wheel, and then we put the position of the waypoint in, in the same way as we did with the aircraft position. So it's going to be north, 52, zero one, two, insert, and west, four, four, zero, insert. And then we check that that's entered on both of the other units. Remember there's uh, two pilots and a flight engineer, so they'd be checking. So I'll set those forward as well to number two, ready for the next waypoint. And then well in, so that's north 52, 14, eight, insert, and west 51, one, insert. Double check that they're all there, excellent. We'll move on to the next one. Oh, it's already filled in, look at that. So to save some time, I filled in positions uh, three through to nine so that we don't have to waste extra time on the video. Let's take the remote function off. And what we have to do now is just check those waypoints are all correct, because it's very easy to make a mistake typing this in. If you're typing in Woburn, that's quite easy to identify on an FMS. All these numbers, all very similar and very easy to get wrong. So we check it by using the distance field. Put it the distance time, go to waypoint change and say waypoint change one to two. Verify that distance from waypoint 1 to waypoint 2 is 14. And always check from the paperwork to the device so that you don't get confused. So waypoint 2 to 3, I'm expecting 57. 2 to 3, and we get 56, that's close enough. Waypoint 3 to waypoint 4, also 56, so 3 to 4. Oh, yep. Yeah. 4 to 5, 71. Close enough. 5 to 6, 62 and uh, so on and so forth. You basically check all the waypoints that way to verify. Now it's important to note I haven't pushed the insert button. The aircraft would still be happily navigating from waypoint zero to waypoint one, or just using that as a check function. So there we go, from waypoint zero to waypoint one. With that all set up, we can probably uh, get rid of the INS flight plan, and we'll just set the displays on the FMS, so the INS, sorry, to be something useful. So let's have a uh, distance time for the pilot, tracking ground speed for the uh, pilot non-flying, and let's have the position on there. So we're all ready to go. Now this would be the point, if you're doing it by the book, this is the point where you double check and put it into nav. Um, as I said, that's a continuity error from the previous video. Okay, so the last thing we get is the air traffic clearance, or maybe we get this first, it in involve transponder code. So let's have 4651. 
and obviously with the air traffic clearance received you double check that what you're planning to fly the chart you're trying you're planning to fly here is uh, what you're expecting check your stop altitude 6000 feet and uh, all the navigation stuff is set up correctly so that's us basically ready to uh, get airborne on the radio navigation and we can follow on with the inertial navigation system afterwards all that we're missing is the performance calculations, the last thing you do on the FMS. Unfortunately, we've got that on the EFB device here. So if I go to performance count, we can read the load sheet for the takeoff, or we can read the sim for the takeoff. I'm going to do flaps 20 departure. And in my case, I've used the load sheet. So my uh, load sheet figures and my SIM figures are very similar. In fact, the only difference is the, the SIM. At the moment, the aircraft has not burned the taxi fuel. So when you use SIM, it's showing you the current weight and load sheet is the planned taxi weight. There's about a ton of taxi fuel. If you used fast load, uh, maybe just putting the information straight in from SIM brief or something like that, obviously your performance calculations from load sheet won't be valid because load sheet assumes you've used the load calculating tool here. So just something to be aware of. So flaps 20, I'm going to use the load sheet and we've got our V1, our rotate, our V2 speeds. I could set the bugs manually, they're all here. But what I'm going to do is just click set speed bugs and that sets the speed bugs on the left hand and the right hand airspeed indicator. And it also sets V2 speed of 173 into the uh, auto throttle speed control. So looking at these speed bugs, you've got V1, you've got rotate, and you've got V2 on the amber bug. And then you've got the flap retraction bugs. So at this bug here, passing this bug, select flaps 10. Passing this bug, flaps 5. This bug, uh, bug flaps 1. And at this bug, select flap 0. But you keep accelerating. What you don't have is a bug for your minimum clean speed. But the good thing is that's very easy for minimum clean on this aircraft, just put 100 knots on your V2 speed. So you go from 173 to 273, and that is your minimum clean speed. So that's the calculations done here. The last few items, stab trim, 6.4 units. So let's make sure that 6.4 units is in the green band, which it is. If it asks for something beyond, uh, let's say, 7.5, you would have to move the green band back or green band forward as required. We're not going to move the stab at the moment because the hydraulics aren't powered but we're just going to make sure the green band is set to 6.4 and the final item is the initial pitch of 9 degrees. So verify the flight directors are on on both sides and then just move the pitch wheel until your pitch command bar goes to 9 degrees. There's 9 degrees. We'll do it for the FO side as well. Now it's important at this point to realise that those pitch bars, it's a fixed index, it's not going to move at all. It's important that the pilot understands that because on the climb out, if you're used to a modern aircraft like an Airbus or a, an Update 737, you're going to pitch and follow the flight director command bar. But that's not what we want to do in this case. We need to maintain a speed of V2 to V2 plus 15, or practically speaking, above this amber bar, this amber bug and below this white bug here. That's roughly where your climb speed is going to be, the initial climb speed. Let's say 180 knots is, is going to be our target. A useful guide on this is on the command bar, we're going to put the bottom of this L bar on the command bar because the command bar here is for a three engine climb out. If you lose an engine on the takeoff roll above V1, this is what you're going to pitch to. So with four engines running, we're going to be a little bit higher than it. And when it's time to accelerate, we're going to pitch just a little bit below that with four engines running, and that should all work out. It sounds complicated, but it should be actually quite straightforward when we come to do it. Just double check, our auto throttle is uh, ready to go in takeoff dry, verify the trims, and then let's get the checklist out. Now before we do the checklist, we're doing this in a slightly different order than what the checklist was designed for. And I'll talk about that as we get to some of the items that don't quite complete. Let's do the before start pilot checklist. Before start checklist, please. Gear lever and lights. 
Down and check. Brakes. Parked. Start levers. Off. Radios. On and check. Flight control hydraulic power. On. INS. Check and nav. Compasses. Slaved. Window heat. On. Seatbelts and no smoking. On. Emergency lights. Armed. Exterior lights. Mm. Okay, so it's stopping there. And the reason it's stopping there is it's looking for the beacon to be switched on. Now, this is, I believe, derived from the TWA checklist from quite a few years ago. These days, we don't switch the beacon on until we're ready to move. So we'd call air traffic for permission to push, they'd give us permission, we'd put the beacon lights on, finish the checklist and push. But in this case, that's very early on in the procedure and we've got this checklist and another checklist to finish. If you're flying on VATSIM and you call for push and then you finish this checklist five minutes later, the controllers might get quite annoyed with you. So all I'm going to do is uh, skip that just now Flight instruments. and allow the checklist to move on. Check. Altimeters and clocks. One, zero, one, three, set and cross check. Radio INS switches. Radio. Radar and transponder. Stand by. Indicator lights. Check. Engine and wing anti-ice. Off. Stall warning. Check. Mock airspeed warning. Check. Auto brakes. Check and off. Body gear steering. Arm. Anti-skid. On. Autopilot and flight director. Hmm. So this checking off for the flight director, that's a TWA oddity. Um, it seems to be that they wanted to do flight director off takeoffs at all times. For me, there's no reason to do that. The Boeing procedures allow you to use the flight director and the intention is to set it for this three engine climb out attitude. But I'm quite happy to leave those flight directors on. As a result, I'll check that item. Takeoff warning. Check. Auto flight enunciators. Check. GPWS. Check. Instrument warning. Check. Flight director computer selectors. Check. Instrument source selectors. Normal. Reserve brake valve. Closed. Spoilers. Down. Static selectors. Normal. Oxygen mask and regulator. Check and emergency off. Brake pressure. Check. Stabilizer trim. Check and on. Rudder and aileron trim. Check. Checklist completed. Excellent. So it's just the beacon light really that we're missing there. Let's go on to the next list and we'll run the flight engineer checks. There'll be a few more items on this and it's the same reason we'll skip them. It's because we're not quite ready to push. We just want to get the majority of the checklist done. Let's go. Battery. On. APU panel. Check. Auxiliary power. Check. Engine oil quantity. Check. Fuel quantity. One, three, nine, three, five, six kilograms. Fuel panel. Check and set. Pressurization controls. Check and set. Bleed controls. Ah, uh, this. Okay, again. That's the uh, aircraft is still cooling the cabin down because we're not quite ready to go yet. So I'll skip that just now. Hydraulic quantity. Check. EPR computer. Ah, uh, this. Again, TWA want to take off in the go-around mode. I, I don't understand that. I've looked at the manual. I don't know why they do that. They seem to be quite unique. So let's ignore that and we'll take off in takeoff dry rating. Circuit breakers. Check. Indicator lights. Check. Electrical panel. Check and set. Air conditioning controls. Let's see. Okay, we'll skip that as well. Fire control and wing overheat panels. Check and set. Equipment cooling. Check. Passenger oxygen. Check. Hydraulic panel. Check and set. 
Fuel jettison panel. Check. Crew oxygen. On. Oxygen mask and regulator. Check and emergency off. 80 piece. Off. Checklist completed. Excellent. So that's both of the checklists done. What we do now is we'd speak to our ground crew and ask them if they are ground checks complete and we, we pressurize the flight controls because what I need to do is to get uh, positive brake pressure. You see my brake pressure is down just a little bit. So I'll set the pumps on for the brake pressure and the body gear steering and then we'll get everything ready to go. So flight backgrounds are we click pressurized controls, A firm pressurized controls. We come over here. I'm going to switch one of the packs off. I'm going to switch the air demand pump on, number one. And just before I do the next item, let's look on the outside. You can see with one of the pumps running, two of the four elevator surfaces are pressurized. We'll come back in here and we put the electric system four pump on. So we've turned this pack off so that this air pump can use some of the bleed demand. On the real 747-200, the bleed demands are quite limiting, so we've got to be careful of the EGT on the APU, make sure we don't overload it. That isn't simulated in this particular model at the moment. As well as that, we can also open the bleed valves because there's an interlock on the bleed valves. It prevents you from stopping the engines unless the bleed valves are in that position. While we're here, just double check the fuel pumps are on and double check your engine oil quantity and the pressures are all good. Having done that, we'll reset the brakes just to make sure the parking brake is set. And with the 747, it's got proper Boeing brakes. So we need to hold the Cockpit tow brakes to ground. Disconnect and ground set power. the parking brake. Parking brake released. Parking brake set. So we've reset the parking ground brake. Ground power disconnected. And they've disconnected ground power. Now, obviously, your ground crew would have done that as part of showing up at the aircraft as well. But because we've reset the parking brake, we can also uh, remove the chocks as well. So in here, Remove Cockpit chocks. to ground. Remove the chocks. Excellent. Chocks removed. So at this point, we say, are you ready to push? And they'll respond in the affirmative. We'll get push better pushback, and we'll start the pushback. Ground to cockpit. Please show me where you want to go. So let me delete this, and we'll talk about this as well. Because we've got body gear steering, if I was just to leave the aircraft here, it would stop with the body gear rotated and that would make it difficult to steer the aircraft. So I'm just going to push it back a little bit and pull it forward in a straight line to make sure it stops in a straight ahead position. The is driving up. So it's a little bit out of sequence because obviously the ground crew would be there already before you uh, start off on this particular flow. We'll call air traffic for permission to push, and they say push approved. With that, we'll verify that the INSs are in nav. We'll put the beacon light on up here. We're going to verify the seatbelts and the fasten seatbelt signs are on. We've got body gear steering armed. On the engineer's panel, we'll switch off one more of the uh, air conditioning packs. We're going to make sure everything else is looking correct on the electrical panel. We'll switch off the galley power because we want to minimize the load on the APU during start. We get pressure on the number one and on the number four okay, hydraulic system. Okay, all doors and hatches are closed, ready to connect. So let's just have another look at that checklist. The exterior lights we've fixed, we've got the beacon on. Bleed controls, we've sorted that out. The bleeds are on, we're still running on one pack to keep the cabin cool. Air conditioning, we'll switch that last pack off before we actually start and everything is mostly done. We should probably put the transponder to transponder mode as well now. That's a more modern thing that you always have the transponder on when you're moving on the apron. Lifting the nose. So connected and bypass pin inserted. Release parking brake. Parking brake released. So parking brake released. Starting pushback and you may start engine. Timer's running. So pushing back, we can start the engines. We'll switch that last pack off. Verify the fuel pumps are on again. We're just going to double check all the uh, engine oil quantities one last time. 
we're going to check that we've got sufficient bleed pressure for the engine start and the bleed valves are open. So let's start engine number four first. Start valve. Ready to start the engine. Goes open. Ready for engine start. And I'm going to hold the number four engine system one to ground start. Starting stop. engine four. Starter valve open. Starter valve's open. N2 is increasing. We're looking for the oil pressure to increase by about 15-16%. Uh, there we go, oil pressure. When it gets to 20%. 20% 20 and 2. We put the number 4 engine. Fuel on. Fuel on. Check the EGT. Light up. Check the acceleration on N1. Verify the oil pressure is coming up. Check the acceleration. Starter off. Wait for stabilized. Engine stabilized. Excellent. Look at the pushback. You can see the body gear steering on the 747. This is why we have to be careful that we don't stop in the turn because with that steering on the main gear turned and 350 tons sitting on it, it's going to make it quite difficult to move. Let's start engine number one. Starting engine one. Start of open. As the start valves open, you can see the pressure drops. You can see the N2 is increasing. So we're looking for oil pressure, which we have. 20%. 20% and 2. Fuel on. Fuel on. Check the EGT increases. Light up. Monitor the EGT. Starter off. Operation complete. Engine stabilized. Break. Okay. Parking brake set. Parking brake set. Disconnecting toes. Stand by. Start number two. Up here. Starting engine two. Start of valve open. N2 is increasing. Waiting for the oil pressure. Just have a quick check of your uh, bleed pressure in between starts. Make sure you've got sufficient start pressure. Uh, there's the oil pressure coming up. 20%. 20% and two. Fuel on. Light up. I'll let the engineer monitor this start. You'll notice on here we've got a rich position as well. If the engines were especially cold overnight, you could do a rich start. Starter off. You simply move them to the rich position until you get engine, engine stabilized, stabilized and then lift up the idle. So last engine, engine number three. Starting engine three. Start of valve open. So is disconnected and bypass pin has been removed the and signal on the right. And the we'll see you next time and have a safe flight. Our pressure is increasing. 20% and 2. Fuel on. Light up. EGT is rising. Here's the tug driving away. And there's a man with a steering pin there. Starter off. Waiting for the engine stabilized. Engine stabilized. Okay, and that's all for engine started. We'll do the pilot stuff first. Obviously this would happen simultaneously on the aircraft. Start valve goes to disarmed. Double check that all the ground start switches are selected off. We're now going to put the probe heaters on. Verify the lights are set accordingly. We'll come across onto the engineer panel. We'll switch off the APU lead air because we're finished with that now. And now we need to transfer the electrics over. So as we did when we're starting the aircraft with the APU and the external power, we have to always check the frequency and the voltage for each of the generators. We'll do it in the same sequence as we started the engine. So generator 4, 400, 115, generator comes on bus and you'll see that knocks one side of the APU off, one APU channel. Number one, 400 and 115 close. I think you see how this goes now. Number two, 400, 115 close. Number three, check and close. With that, we can close the split system breaker and we are pretty much done with the APU. I'll put the galley power back on again because the power transfer has happened. We'll put the packs Pack it on to number one, number two, number three, the 
air pumps, we can put those to auto because at the moment the uh, engine system is uh, like the engine pumps are providing pressure, the demand pumps are standing by just in case. You'll notice the electric hydraulic pump switched itself off. That toggled off automatically as soon as the hydraulic pressure was there from the engine pump. We'll close the cap. And finally up here we'll put the aft car reheat switch to normal. Having done that, we can come back to the pilot's actions and do the standard pilot stuff. So I'll set flaps to flaps 20. There's 1, 5, and 20. I'll set the trim. We can either do it with the levers here or we can use the key binding. 6.4 is what we're looking for. That's set. It's inside the green band. Double check down here. Make sure that the rudder trim is neutral. Uh, sorry, the aileron trim and the rudder trim are neutral. Rudder trim's here and the alarm trim you'd see up here. Last thing we've got to do on the 747 is a flight control check. We do that before moving and we want to be careful of the rudder assembly on the aircraft. It's a huge rudder on the 747. We don't want to move it too quickly. So here we go, flight control check. There's full up elevator. Full down elevator. Neutral. Full left aileron, full right aileron, neutral, and the rudders. There's full right rudder, full left rudder, and neutral. Let's get the checklist out and see what we've missed. There might be a few items, let's just double check. So after start checklist. After start checklist. Flight recorder. On. Start switches. Off. Beacon lights. On. Brake pressure. Check. Start levers. Idle detent. Engine and the ice. Off. Electrical panel. Check. Back valves. Open. Dual warning lights. Out. Hydraulic panel. Check. Flight recorder. On. We've also got a checklist taxi completed. checklist to go, so let's do the taxi checks as well. Taxi checklist, please. Flaps. Flaps 20. Flaps 20. Take of data, EPR and airspeed bugs. Set and cross check. Stabilize the trim. Set in green band. Probe heat. On. Flight controls. Check. Yaw dampers. Check. Seat belts and shoulder harness. Check. APU. Ah, uh, this. Oh yes, I should probably switch the APU off. That's why they have uh, multiple crew on the aircraft. So it's have its cooldown cycle, APU goes off. Any second now. So it's pretty good that the checklist actually monitors Off. what you're doing. It makes sure you're not doing the wrong Fuel thing. Heat. Off. Totalizer and gross weight. Set. Flight engineer and pilot panel. Check. Aft cargo heat. Normal. Seat belts and shoulder harness. Check. Taxi checklist completed. Okay, we've just got the before takeoff checklist to go and then we're good. So I'll we'll request permission to taxi from air traffic. They're going to tell us to taxi out. For us, we're going out to runway 27 right, which is here. So we're basically going to go ahead here, turn right, out on the parallel taxiway, all the way down for a full length of departure. So tax lights coming on. We're clear ahead. We're clear left. We're clear right. And brakes on. Parking brake released. So we'll use minimum power to taxi. And... Although it might seem difficult to taxi at first because you're a lot higher up, um, it's really just a case of keeping the yellow line underneath you, as you would with any other aircraft. On some really tight corners you may have to go slightly outside the yellow line with the nose gear to make sure the mains stay on the, the correct centre line. But really, on a big airport taxiway, it shouldn't be an issue. Fuel truck and belt loaders notwithstanding, this should be uneventful.
So we've got the ground speed indicating on the HSI. On an A320, you'd be looking at 10 to 15 knots, 10 knots for a tight turn. And there's no reason why the 747 can't go those speeds as well. You probably wouldn't take it up to the kind of 30 knots that we can taxi in a straight line on the Airbus, just because it's a little bit bigger, there's a lot more brake energy to slow it down. So around we go. If you're having trouble steering, check the options menu in your EFB. I've got a pillar control on my uh, joystick paddle, the throttle paddle. You can use rudder pedals obviously as well. But just make sure it's set correctly. It gives you the option to choose what you want to use for steering. So now that we're out of the cul-de-sac and an unexpected power increase wouldn't be as big of an issue, we'll come down onto the panel here and I'll make sure that it goes into auto throttle eper mode, take off dry. It's still selected off, it just means that if we were to split that on it would have a power increase now. Also while we're taxiing out, if you really want to, you've got the PA buttons here for the cabin crew to, to do their jobs. I don't tend to bother with that. What we can do is switch the weather radar on and the transponder to TARA. The screen's on here. There's nothing ahead of us now to, affect, to be affected by our radar radiation. So if you read the procedures for this aircraft, if you've got some of the real world documents for this aircraft, you might be tempted to try and do things exactly as per the manual. And I totally understand that. But what is important to realise is you're operating this aircraft effectively single pilot. So what you want to do is prioritise the jobs you're doing. So if there's like a flight engineer job that says you do it when you're entering the runway, just do it a little bit before that to get it out of the way because there's no consequence of doing that. And when we're airborne, things that would happen simultaneously, what I want you to think about is concentrate on the up and down actions first, then the left and the right actions, and then the flipping the switches. So it's like aviate, aviate, navigate, communicate. Make sure the aircraft is climbing correctly, make sure it's accelerating correctly, then worry about the heading, and then worry about the switches on the flight engineer panel. On a similar subject, we're going to be flying this uh, departure gear, which is achievable with radio navigation aids. If you're flying from an airport that don't have, uh, doesn't have suitable radio navigation aids anymore, or doesn't have known RNAV procedures, then you can tie yourself up in knots worrying about how to do it right. All that matters is that you do something that's reasonable in the simulator. You're teaching yourself a skill. You're teaching yourself how to navigate with radio aids. If it's not the exact same procedure as the flight crews followed in the 1980s, 90s, then that doesn't matter so much because all you're doing is teaching yourself how to do it. You're not trying to recreate a specific procedure, you're just learning the skills in doing so. And really it's the same when you're doing VOR navigation as well. If you can't find the specific route, if the actual VORs don't exist anymore and you have to use a slightly non-standard route, then it doesn't really matter. Is it worth uh, ruining your sim experience or making your sim experience much harder? I don't think it is. I think you can have the same, you can learn the same flying skills, even if the route you're flying isn't exactly 100% period correct. Doesn't that make sense? So down here's the end of the runway. What we'll do is I'll start configuring the flight engineer panel. I'll switch off uh, one of the air conditioning packs. We're going to do a pack soft departure. I'm just going to verify that my fuel system is still set correctly, which it is. We're going to put the ignition switches on. There's eight of them. All uh, eight switches go to flight start. That's your ignition off the departure. You'll notice back here the press light on the body gear steering. That tells you the body gear steering is armed and ready to go. We want to disarm that before we apply takeoff power and that's the switch up here. Just close the cap and the switch will go off. So let's have that checklist out just now. So all that's interesting, icing considerations, cabin alert, transponder, ignition, body gear steering, packs, pumps, 
pressurization and cross feed valves. That should all be taken care of. Let's switch one of the other packs off. So we're down to one pack again. We'll do the final pack just as we enter the runway. And you'll find you need a little bit of power to keep it taxing. When it's at very heavy weights, it won't taxi on idle thrust. And I think that's fairly realistic. I know the at, at very heavy weights, the Airbus needs a little bit of power. At most lighter weights, it's happy just to, to motor along at idle thrust. Nearly there. It's a big airport Heathrow. When you're just learning this aircraft as well, I've seen some, some videos and some reports on the, the forum and the Discord and people uh, demonstrating the aircraft and they're using it at very, very light weights. What I'd say is it's always better with this sort of aircraft to load it up to a heavier weight to get started because then everything just happens a little bit slower. Uh, it gives you a little bit more time to think. I know that when pilots were flying Concorde, they weren't allowed to do lightweight takeoffs for months and months until they were current on the aircraft. They had to do normal in-service weight departures until they were properly current on the aircraft before uh, they were properly familiar with the aircraft before they could do a lightweight takeoff because at lightweight takeoffs, everything happens very quickly. So we'll close that last act valve there. So the air conditioning system is off, we're good to go. I'm gonna put the landing lights on Turn off lights off and the strobes can come on and then we'll get the checklist ready to go. So the before takeoff checklist. Before takeoff checklist. Icing considerations. Check. Cabin alert. Check. Transponder. Check. Ignition. Flight start. Body gear steering. Damn. Okay. So that's fine. We'll skip that just now. Back files. Closed. Presentation mode selector. Auto. Fuel boost pumps. On. Cross feed files. Check. Before takeoff checklist completed. Okay. So the reason the body gear is still armed is because I've still got a 90 degree turn to go here. That may require the body gear steering. So we'll start the turn. You see on the flight engineer panel, left body gear steering is unlocked. So if we'd switch the body gear steering off, we'd now be scrubbing the tires and that would not be a good thing. So obviously at this point we'd be ready to go, we'd get our air traffic clearance for takeoff. So I'm just going to line up, I'm going to roll ahead until those body gear steering lights go out and then I'll close the body gear steering cap here and we're good for takeoff. Before we release the brakes and do it, we'll just have a think about that procedure, just to remind ourselves what we're going to do. Parking brake set. Set the brake just now. So, as I said, we're going to pitch to maintain V2 to V2 plus 15. That's approximately this L bar sitting on top of the pitch index there. But we have to fly it. We can't just blindly follow guidance because this is a fixed reference. I'm going to climb ahead until we get to 3D from the London, ND, uh, London DME. Then we're going to turn right onto course 297 towards the uh, Burnham MDV. We'll arm, forelock and pick up Midhurst. Should all make sense. In this version of the aircraft, there's a little bug with it, or seems to be a little bug with it. We're still checking it out, but... Um, it's best to use the autopilot rather than just try and follow the flight directors because on the flight director pitch modes it seems to be getting confused at the moment. It may not be an issue but it's just something that's been reported. So we'll see how this does. This should be effectively a normal departure for the aircraft. Parking brakes released. Parking brake released. And what we're going to do is apply thrust until we get the stabilized. Paul. Stabilized. And when we get stabilised, click the auto thrust on and verify EPR mode. Auto thrust is now applying full power, or 
rates it power the EPR takeoff setting. And we're just keeping the aircraft on the center line. Cross set. Set. Almost good. When we get rotate, I'm looking for about eight seconds to rotate to the climax. It's not as fast as a smaller aircraft. V1. Rotate. Positive rate. Gear up. Gear up. So they are pitching just beyond that target. Looking at my airspeed indicator now. I'll just trim it for there, that looks to be a reasonable pitch attitude, maybe about 12 and a half degrees. Speed's washing back, I'll just lower the nose ever so slightly. Just keep wings level. Gears up. And we're looking for just about a thousand feet. So there we go. One thousand feet, I'll go command A. And I'll flick the system into vertical speed mode, and I'll lower the vertical speed dial down to about uh, 500 feet and select the altitude. Here's above the flaps 10 flap, so flaps 10 can be selected. This can have on 3 miles. There's 3 miles, I'll turn it on to 297, say 300. Keeping an eye on the needle. Above the flaps uh, 10 bugs, so select flaps 5. When we select flaps 5, we'll go to fine thrust. Put 100 knots on there, so 273 and then go to Eper mode, I uh, go to uh, speed mode, sorry, verify speed in 273. Above the next bug, flaps one. Flaps one. We'll arm or lock, pick up mid first, we get nav in amber. Above the flap zero bug. Flaps up. We get flaps up, we'll turn one of the packs on. Again, the engineer would have done that on the climber. It's captured nav. When it captures nav, I'm going to turn the heading bug roughly where I want it, 356. And now, because I'm in speed mode, it's just going to bring the power back and maintain the rate of climb. So I've got some excess power now. It should be able to do 1500 feet a minute. And speed and vertical speed are your friends in the thermal area. Let's turn the second pack on. Up here, we'll turn off the ignition. can turn off two of the lights as well. Let's have the uh, onboard lights on. So flap zero, plan the gear can go to the off position and we should be climbing away. Verify that it's tracking out of Midhurst. We could identify Midhurst if we wanted. We're listening for a double M or M which is dash dash. And obviously we're heading out quite happily towards uh, Inlat and Melbourne just now. What I want to do is to put the INS in charge of navigation. If I flick this switch here to INS, we can see what the INS is planning to do. The autopilot is still steering on the VOR, so nothing to worry about there. I just want to tell the INS to go from here to Woburn. So waypoint change, 0, 1, insert. It centres the line there. I'm happy with that. We go to INS and I've got nav steer. So now the INS is doing all the business. And that's us climbing away quite happily. Verify that we've got all the packs on and we should be in a comfortable condition. And that's pretty much it. With a little climb, you've only got maybe 1400 feet to go. 1500 feet, feet per minute is fine. The fact it's not using all the power the aircraft has available, that's not a problem at all. I'll show you how to do a bigger climb in just a second. Down to level off. There you go, 5,000 feet. She's going to be a little bit low on the altitude, but remember these are modern charts. These altitude constraints are based on modern aircraft performance, not a heavyweight 747-200 uh, from ages ago. So don't worry about that too much. It's really only the terrain considerations I'd be, I'd be concerned about. Everything's good. 
thing is happening quite nicely. So as we're leveling off, always double check your auto thrust is in speed mode here, speed or Mach mode. If it's saying Eper in there, all that's going to happen is you'll level off and you'll just fly uh, with increasing speed and it'll all get a bit messy. So there we are, levelling at 6,000 feet. If I get another climb and I want to go up to, let's say, flight level 80, it's a low transition in the UK. So let's just dial up the altitude selector, 80. And we'll see that what happens is it goes into alt select amber and it applies a vertical speed. You can see what it's targeting here, it's going for about 1,000 feet a minute. And that's fine, it's just going to find its way all the way up to flight level 80. Everything is quite simple at this point. The flight engineer's got a job to do now. He wants to try and keep as much fuel in the main four fuel tanks as possible. We don't want to always run off the center tank on takeoff, that'd be a bad thing. You don't want one fuel source feeding all the engines. But at this point, it's going to be quite safe. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open the crossfeed valves number two and number three. So crossfeed valves are both open. Verify the fuel pressure doesn't fluctuate. And then we're going to set the boost pumps off for number one and number four. Notice the pumps we, we change have got the red background. These pumps two and three stay on all the time. So boost pumps go off, check the fuel pressure, and boost pumps here go off, check the fuel pressure. Just check the aircraft's navigating, find 1000 feet to go, we're in speed mode. So you're probably wondering, why is it using just this fuel now? Why isn't it still feeding from this fuel? Uh, when these pumps are on and this fuel tank's open, why is it only using this? Well, that's because these pumps here in the centre tank are override pumps and jettison pumps. They run at a much higher pressure than the main pumps, so it will use this fuel in priority. But when this tank empties without changing anything else, the two and three pumps will take over feeding both engines without any concerns whatsoever. We'll put the fuel heat switches on just now, put them to auto. We'll level at 8,000 feet, so our flight level at 80. There's Alp Select going in that green, and we'll do a big climb after that. Notice the INS is showing the alert light, telling you it's, uh, it's just closing in, it's a minute away from the turn. So let's say I want to do a big climb going from flight level 80. Well, let's go all the way up to flight level 300. So I'm just going to spin the altitude selector up to 300. But rather than doing it in vertical speed mode, which is is not great for a big climb, I'm just going to put the power to deeper mode, which puts the throttles forward. Verify deeper here, and then put the vertical mode into IES. And with the vertical mode in IES, the aircraft is going to follow or maintain whichever speed it has selected. If you use the modern aircraft, don't be confused by this auto throttle speed dial here. This is only an auto throttle mode, it doesn't control the speed pitch mode. Okay, so it will maintain 275 because that's what we had when we selected it. And while we're talking about that auto throttle speed dial up here, I hope you noticed that I went to climb thrust when we were in Eper mode on the takeoff, but I didn't select speed mode before I'd selected the minimum clean speed, the 273, because if this was still V2 at 173, and I went speed mode down here, it would take all the power off, and we really don't want to do that. So we'll switch off the uh, rest of the landing lights passing through flight level 100, we'll put the local light off as well, and then we can run the checklist. Again, there's some things on the after takeoff climb checklist that um, happen in a little bit different or a little bit odd places with the PWA get list. It's looking for the no smoking and seatbelt signs to check. We can actually switch the fasten seatbelt signs off about one of them. There we go. After takeoff checklist. Gear lever. Off. Landing and logo lights. Off. Ignition. Check. Seatbelts and no smoking sign. Check. Back valves. Open. Fuel heat. 
Auto. Officer takeoff checklist completed. Excellent, and that's us for 4,800 miles. Just some tidying up. Don't forget to keep the FO up to date as well. He wants to be looking at the INS. His system is by default looking at INS number two, just to monitor what's going on. And now we're above flight level 100. We probably don't want to maintain a 275 knot climb. We can go faster than that. So let's go to vertical speed mode. And I'll lower the pitch of the vertical speed down to 1,000 feet a minute and let the aircraft accelerate. One of the traps to avoid is getting a speed or mark on the pitch mode and also speed and mark on the auto throttle. It doesn't like that at all. One of them will drop out. So it's important that if you're using EPR mode, uh, you're using EPR mode for IES. So you've got full power and holding the pitch with IES. At the moment I'm in vertical speed mode just to let it accelerate. On your performance calc here, it actually shows you your optimum climb speed of 333 knots. Seems fairly reasonable. We can use the orange plug here, for the auto prop, just as a reminder. But that doesn't have any effect, just to make that little pointer move forward. Whilst that's happening, let's have a look at the departure. You can see that we flew it to Woburn, you know, we're risking up towards Wellen, and then hopefully on up towards Trent. So the INS, using it earlier on in the flight, this gives us that little bit more capacity to manage the aircraft. Once this is available on uh, shared copilot or uh, shared cockpit or shared flight, uh, it might be really fun to fly as a, a multiple aircraft because there's a lot of interesting things to do. But at the moment, it's all about managing your workload. So use the INS a little bit earlier on in the departure. And you know what? If it makes you feel happier, use the FMS for your first few, few flights with it. Makes it just that little bit easier as well. So there's the target speed. I'll flip the pitch mode over to IES. And it's going to pitch up to maintain the current and select speed. Just as a reminder, I'm only using that orange bug as a visual marker. That value there is not doing anything at all at the moment. I can change over to mark mode on the climb when it's appropriate to do so. I can go back into speed mode or mark mode as required. I need to change my rating to cruise when I get the proper flight. But otherwise, that's our setup ready for the flight. I hope that all makes sense. In the next video, we'll have a look at the inertial navigation system and how to navigate the aircraft in a bit more detail. Following on from that, we'll look at the fuel system, how to make sure you don't run the pipes dry and use the fuel in the correct sequence. And then we'll have a look at the landing approach into Phoenix. As always with my videos, when I watch the videos back, I find things that I've said that are incorrect or I've done that are incorrect. So always check the video description for errors, omissions and clarifications for anything that I think has been missed out on the video. I'd love to read your comments. Uh, please let me know what you've thought of the video and what you think of the aircraft. And I hope you join me again soon. Thanks very much.